The USS Marblehead started life without any especially great expectations. She was part of the Omaha class and thus one of the few modern cruisers that the US Navy had been allowed to build up to that point in the 20th century. The class would be the last of the US Navy's pre-treaty cruisers. With the hull number CL-12 marking her as the penultimate ship in the class, Marblehead was laid down in August 1920 at the William Cramp and Sons Yard in Philadelphia, alongside her sisters Richmond, Concord, Trenton, and the last of the class, Memphis. Launched in October 1923 and commissioned in September 1924, she spent the majority of the interwar period cruising in the main areas of US interest, the Caribbean and the Western Pacific, along with taking part in various fleet problems. Various changes were made to her equipment during this period. The mines and their equipment were removed, along with about 40% of her torpedo launchers, and the anti-aircraft battery was increased, whilst the main battery of 6-inch guns was mildly reduced. She was assigned to the Asiatic Fleet when the Pacific War broke out in December 1941. At this stage, the Omahas were considered to be verging on obsolete. They were relatively small, with what much of the main battery mounted in casemates, and a relative paucity of armour and deck space for more anti-aircraft guns. And so the class as a whole would spend most of the war in second-line roles. But this was not to be Marblehead's fate with the Asiatic fleet rather rapidly diminishing and the Japanese making inroads into taking over the Philippines, the ship would be on the front line of the opening stages of the Pacific Campaign. As with many ships in this part of the world, a good portion of the ship's galley and washing areas were staffed by Chinese workers, and they bore grim tidings. According to their tradition, a flying fish landing on your ship was bad luck, and just such a creature had launched itself through a porthole when the ship had barely left land behind. Given that this was the ship's first combat deployment, and it was already a retreat from her peacetime port, which looked about to be overrun, this didn't seem to bode too well. The ship headed south through the Celebes Sea on its way to join up with the Dutch on Australian naval units in the vicinity, and then more news came over the Tannoy. The exact status of Pearl Harbour was not being distributed as yet, but they knew it was bad, but the news of the fall of Wake Island did manage to reach them in full. Reaching the port of Balikpapan without further incident, the crew were given two primary tasks, fully fueling the ship, which was relatively easily done once somebody found the correct oil hoses, and stripping out the ship ready for combat. Various items that had been assigned to the ship or otherwise acquired now went ashore. Anything made of wood was a priority, both to reduce shrapnel risks and fire hazards if the ship took a hit. The ship's motorboats were also sent away, and a number of now empty boat davits were cut away to open up the firing arcs of the three-inch anti-aircraft guns. These works were interrupted by still more bad news. Further assessment of the damage at Pearl Harbor in now included the detail that several battleships had been sunk, and this was followed swiftly by the news of the destruction of HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse out to the west of their current berth. More than one crewman looked at the seven single three-inch guns and the quartet of 50 cal machine guns and wondered what chance their ship stood if they should come under air attack from the apparently omnipresent Imperial Japanese Navy Air Force. This was then followed by the news that Germany and Italy had declared war on the USA and a Japanese carrier had been sighted moving south, presumably to mop up the various merchant ships and associated small warships that were collecting around Marblehead. This latter threat would actually fail to materialise immediately, although a slightly odd report then followed which informed the bemused men of the ship that USS Marblehead had now been sunk with all hands. After briefly checking to ensure they were not in fact in Davy Jones' locker, the crew got back to work preparing for their apparently sunken vessel to be deployed for war. Morale was further boosted over the next few days by the arrival of the large cruisers Houston and Boise, three auxiliary ships and four destroyers. Shortly thereafter, in company with USS Langley, the US Navy's first aircraft carrier and now converted into a seaplane tender, four destroyers, two oilers and a supply ship, Marblehead sailed south for Makassar Harbour, paying particular attention to the supply ship Gold Star, as it was known to be carrying a large supply of beer and whiskey. Without sonar, the crew had to leave anti-submarine duties to the destroyers, 
She also lacked a voice radio for talking quickly to the other ships, and so the more technically minded of the crew began to build one from various spare parts. Apart from a single anti-shipping mine, which had evidently broken loose from somewhere else and floated into their path, and was subsequently destroyed by gunfire, the voyage to Makassar passed without any real incident. After a brief pit stop, it was time to head further south to Surabaya, the main Dutch naval base in the area. Christmas was thus spent at Surabaya, and Marblehead escaped echoes of the 2nd Pacific Squadron when a crewman purchased a cobra from a local snake charmer, intending to bring it aboard the ship to practice himself. But the snake fortunately escaped during an altercation said crew member had with a local on his way back to the ship. The start of 1942 saw the ship escorting ships headed for Darwin, Australia, where it briefly became the radio station there, as Darwin's own facilities were hopelessly overwhelmed by the sheer number of signals it was now receiving. Then it headed back to Surabaya, but on their way back on the 15th of January, they received word that the ship was being nominated to attack a concentration of Japanese shipping. The odds for success of the mission didn't sound too promising. The estimated escort of this convoy was a light cruiser, a heavy cruiser, and at least 10 destroyers. They were protecting about 20 transport ships. Against this would be ranged Marblehead and four old Clemson class destroyers. The main advantage they considered that they had was speed, as if needed they reckoned they could probably outrun the Japanese, something which the otherwise newer and far more capable Boise could not. The proposed tactics were relatively simple. They'd run it at full speed at sunset, the destroyers would try to torpedo the Japanese cruisers whilst Marblehead engaged the Japanese destroyers on its own until their, its own destroyers could come back to help. The crew spent much of the voyage en route busy with final preparations, with the captain putting himself in the place of the Japanese force commander to try and work out what the likely response would be to the assault. But with less than 24 hours before they made contact, intelligence was received that the convoy had moved, and so the US formation was ordered back. This didn't last for long though. Soon enough, the convoy, or at least one very similar to it, was spotted again, now headed for Balik Papan. This time, Boise was nominated to lead the destroyers, with Marblehead and the destroyer Bulma remaining behind, with the Marblehead being used as a fueling point by the destroyers that were about to get underway. The crew took this chance to get a good ribbing in on the men of USS Pillsbury, who the day before had led a spirited attack out into a sonar contact in the middle of the bay that had turned out to be a school of fish. To add insult to injury after the expenditure of several fruitless depth charges, the destroyer turned out to have no fuel aboard for its boats, and so the Bulma had lowered its own boats, which had swooped in to collect the bounty of freshly floating pre-tenderised tropical fish. This second excursion went about as well as the first. Boise ran into a coral reef and damaged her hull badly enough to slow her down, and so Marblehead was sent out to relieve the damaged cruiser, taking on fuel from her and then leading the attack on the Japanese forces herself, as these were now reported to be in the Makassar Straits. En route, this plan was modified, with the destroyers being sent in first, with Marblehead standing off to cover and follow up if needed. The men on the cruiser waited, and waited, and waited, and then around dawn, the scout aircraft that was mounted aft was sent aloft. After some time climbing, four ships' wakes were spotted heading towards Marblehead. After some long minutes nervously waiting to see what ships were associated with these wakes, it was established that they were, in fact, the destroyers that had been sent out earlier, all intact, undamaged, and with very happy crews. Unknown to them at the time, the Dutch submarine HNLMS K-18 was partially responsible for their good fortune, as the K-18 had launched an attack on the convoy just after midnight, which had sunk the transport Suruga Maru and drawn the cruiser Naka and the destroyers that were escorting the convoy away as they tried to hunt down the sub. This then left the convoy unguarded. The destroyers were further assisted by the fact that the previous day Dutch aircraft had bombed and sunk the Nana Maru in shallow water, her still blazing wreck serving as a bit of a navigational beacon. Passing the sub-hunting Japanese escorts without being recognised as hostile, the destroyers found the transports protected only by a dozen small patrol craft. Bypassing most of these, the destroyers unloaded their torpedoes first for a stealth attack, 
succeeding in blowing up two ammunition ships, which was decidedly less stealthy, then scoring the kill on an old destroyer that had been turned into a patrol craft. Another transport was sunk before the ships ran out of torpedoes, and so they shot up a couple more transports with their four-inch guns before retiring. Unable to find the attackers in time, the Japanese escort force was left to belatedly return to their diminished charges. Whilst the attack wasn't soon enough to save the area from Japanese occupation, as the troops aboard the convoy had by this stage already landed, the loss of fuel, supplies and ammunition aboard the sunken transports would be unhelpful to Japanese efforts in the following weeks. At the time, though, the destroyers believed they'd sunk seven ships, and either way, the crews aboard both them and the Marblehead were perfectly happy with a good night's work. A week later, on the 31st of January, another force was spotted. Two cruisers, 12 destroyers, and a number of transports. Marblehead and the destroyers were sent in again. This time, the tactic was planned to be for the destroyers to sail in a line formation, then make a large, wide, arcing turn, which would allow them to fire off their torpedoes. Marblehead would be shooting its main guns over them, and would then finally unleash her torpedoes as a cover for withdrawal against any response from the Japanese Navy. Late in, their off in the afternoon, on their way towards Balikpapan, an aircraft was briefly spotted to starboard but vanished before anyone could get any idea of what type of aircraft it was or what nationality it was. However, the aircraft was Japanese, and soon enough a spotting report from it caused five more cruisers and a collection of submarines to be ordered to intercept the American formation. Luckily, a lone and daring US Navy scout bomber managed to sneak a look at Balikpapan Harbour as dusk approached. It spotted the assembled cruisers and reported back. This, in turn, was passed on to the Marblehead, and the formation was ordered to turn back, lest they be wasted for no good return, fighting 7-1 to one odds. Meeting up with USS Houston the next day, the combined force now had six destroyers and the two cruisers, and they were in turn ordered to meet up with the Dutch flagship De Reuter, and its own escorting forces, which included the Tromp, some which was something between a large destroyer and a small cruiser, along with a mixed force of seven destroyers. On the 3rd of February, the formation was overflown by a Japanese bomber formation that was en route to bomb Surabaya, but one aircraft hung back and circled for a bit, obviously conducting reconnaissance. The next day, the 4th of February 1942, just after 0900 in the morning, a message arrived. 37 aircraft had been spotted an hour before heading south-southwest, Presumably another bombing raid headed for Surabaya. But even as the message was distributed through the fleet, the lookouts spotted a formation of twin-engine bombers bearing the red sun that marked them as Japanese. Cruising at 17,000 feet, they were headed straight for the combined formation of Allied warships. The ships then went to general quarters and began to scatter, which was doctrine at the time for a formation under air attack to try and make it harder for the aircraft to decide where to attack, and thus hopefully split them up. Marblehead was rapidly climbing in speed. She already had steam for 27 knots, and the last six boilers were being lit off as fast as possible to give her additional steam pressure. Ammunition was passed to the guns, and the order was passed to, and here I quote a crewman who was actually there, set condition Z. All over the ships, hatches and bulkhead doors were sealed shut. 4,000 gallons of unused aviation fuel was quickly sent over the side. Now the attack began in earnest. The conversation that took place on the bridge was recorded, although obviously probably slightly edited for profanity, and so I'll present it here with a few additional comments to explain the events as they happen. They're dividing into squadrons, Captain. Apparently, one for each cruiser. One squadron is heading this way. Very well. Steady her on 85 true. Aye, aye, sir. Steady her on 85 true. Captain, I think they're about to start their run on us. All engines are head full. All engines are head full, sir. Bishop, keep your eyes peeled on those planes and give me the word about a minute and a half before bomb release so I can manoeuvre out of trouble. They're now at their release point, Captain. Give her left full rudder, quartermaster. Left full rudder, sir. The anti-aircraft guns now opened up on the two waves of aircraft, 9-strong and 8-strong respectively. These swept over the ship. However, as they passed overhead, 
they failed to release any bombs. They must be testing the ceiling of our flak. Uh, Captain, there are eight more planes approaching the port bow. Open fire. Again, the ship turned hard to port and the aircraft dropped no bombs. The nine-strong formation had wheeled back and was making another run. Captain, they're at their release point. Right rudder, 15 degrees. Tell engine room all speed possible. The bombs have been released, sir. It's going to be close. Seat cover. Bombs coming. Lie flat. The bombs landed just over 60 feet away, but resulted in no apparent damage other than some very wet bend in the foremast. In exchange, smoke was seen coming from one of the aircraft. This plane, unable to maintain altitude, began a suicide run on Marblehead. As it grew larger and larger, it eventually came within 50 cal range. The machine gunners, in a brief moment of inspiration, walked their tracer fire onto the aircraft's cockpit, and suddenly the bomber veered off course and smashed into the sea. The time was now exactly 10.25, and another wave of eight planes began their bombing run. Release point reached was followed by seat cover, lie flat, over the ship's tannoy. This time, however, bombs struck home, and Marblehead leaped into the air. The men on Houston's bridge swore that they could see daylight between Marblehead's keel and the sea. Then the ship was engulfed in a blinding flash, and she all but vanished beneath a wall of fire and water. Houston's quartermaster shook his head and remarked, There goes Marblehead. When the bridge crew had regained their senses, most of the ship aft of the bridge was billowing dense black smoke. Internal communications were down, and the ship was stuck in a hard left turn as the steering refused to respond. It was also clear that the ship was rather rapidly taking on water. In fact, the ship's communications hub deep in the bowels of the ship had been completely devastated. The comms boards had been blown off the walls, then flooded as water poured into the hull. The one man who'd actually made it to this station before all the hatches had been sealed, electrician Sevi, was left to rapidly vacate the area. But the water was rising so fast and was pushing so much air before it, he couldn't actually close the hatch behind him. Thinking fast, he body slammed the hatch, driving it briefly to the deck, which was just long enough for him to spin the wheel and seal it before the building air pressure behind could blow it open again. Next door, in the gyro compass room, which at its heart was a 20-pound wheel of metal spinning at 9,000 RPM, the crew noticed that the casing was damaged, and in the process of choosing just exactly when this 20-pound spinning weight was going to hurl itself all around the room as the gyro compass disintegrated. The men there, along with survivors from one of the magazines, were forced to climb the cluttered interior of the tripod mast as fires had cut off all other available routes of escape. Elsewhere, up forward, the powerfully built bull Aschenbrenner, a man who was usually enamoured of all things destructive, was seen leaning almost completely into the fires that had sought to creep further along the ship, expending extinguisher after extinguisher that other men could barely stand to pass him, such was the heat. And when those ran out, he picked up mattresses and blankets and clubbed fires to death with them. The first officer, Goggins, who was caught in the blast and flashed so badly that his skin began to crisp and fall off even as he made his way to the bridge, had to be ordered to lie down and accept a shot of morphine before he stopped trying to help. Covered in oil, 15 foot down by the bow and listing quite heavily to starboard, Marblehead seemed minutes away from going down. Right aft, the fantail was so much of a mess of twisted steel, the barbette and turret crew in the area were pretty much the only bemused survivors still intact, as the relatively minimal armour of their station had turned the blast just long enough for the majority of its fury to vent through the ship's sides. But their trouble wasn't over. As the flames grew, they recalled that there were 18 large cans full of powder charges for the aft 6-inch turret in the chief petty officer's quarters. They'd been placed there to allow a rapid opening of fire whilst the main supply of ammunition was brought up from the magazines. That amount of powder would blow what was left of the stern clean off and finish the ship off for shore. Three men made their way down into the inferno and found the room in question already on fire. Debris pinned the cans in place and could not be shifted. Taking an extreme risk, they opened up the nearest cans, lifted out the cloth powder bags and ran like hell for the ladders. Somehow, despite having to make several such runs, 
They didn't pass any of the powder bags near enough to any of the flames, nor did any sparks reach them, and the powder was soon on its way to the bottom of the ocean. One last trip managed to extract the aft magazine crew, who'd been busy activating sprinklers, and then it was just a case of hoping the Japanese aircraft didn't try to finish the job. Heroic efforts across the ship were holding back the fire aft, and five more men were headed down to try and reset the ship's rudder, working on the theory that by opening the hydraulic lines, which cri would cripple the normal mechanism of the steering by robbing it of all pressure, the rudder might be able to return to normal. If they were wrong, and the rudder or its mechanisms were physically warped, nothing would shift it, and they'd have just covered themselves in oil in the middle of a ship that was currently on fire. In the steering room, a mess of half-flooded decks that was waist-deep in water and oil, with the bodies of the men who'd been stationed there floating past, and the deck itself something of an uneven twisted minefield, the crew began trying to drain the steering system of its hydraulic fluid. About the only place aboard the ship in some semblance of good order was, remarkably enough, the machinery spaces, which was just as well, since supplying power to the ship and keeping it going through the water were about the only things that were currently keeping the ship afloat. High above, satisfied that the vessel was stuck going in circles, the Japanese bombers switched targets, first landing a direct hit on USS Houston, and then going after the De Reuter. But using the intermission, bucket brigades were organised, and the surviving electricians were working on rigging auxiliary lines to try and restore power to areas of the ship that had lost it. Searches were on to find and set up the surviving portable pumps in the areas that had been worst affected by the ingress of water. Finally, in a room where everything was covered in oil, the pressure release on the steering system was finally found, and the ship stopped spiralling. Although the list to starboard now rapidly became a list to port, as the lessening horizontal inertia allowed water to settle more in accordance with where it actually wanted to go. With two destroyers in attendance, Marblehead had 26 of her compartments completely flooded another eight partially flooded, and steering was possible only by varying the output of the engines. But she was at least still capable of over 20 knots, the fires were gradually being pushed back and put out, and with the Japanese bombers having expended the last of their bombs, there was now a decision to be made on where to go. Heading west would leave her in range of Japanese aircraft, and stuck out at sea. Any follow-up attack would easily finish her off. Heading south and then east would in theory get the ship to Australia, which would be the safest final destination in the immediate vicinity, but the high seas that would be in their way would probably snap the ship in two. Surabaya was the closest port, but the ship was now drawing far too much water to make it through the approach channel. The only option, therefore, was to head south through the Lombok channel and then head west along the south coast of Java to reach the port of Chilachap. A few hours later, a signal arrived from Admiral Dorman, agreeing with the plan and assigning two cruisers for, to help her on the way. With almost no steering, as the ship was quite long and thin and her inner screws were actually pretty close to the centre line, Marblehead meandered south, occasionally being forced to circle as a current forced her bow around. Sound-powered phones were rigged between the engine room and the bridge, and with no way to communicate with her escorts except by signal lamp, Marblehead crept on into the night. A large pump in the engine room was dismounted and gradually eased up and along the passages of the ship on improvised chains and beam runners in an effort to get some more pumping capacity forward. Then a squall hit, and with no functioning compass or any real ability to see beyond the bow of the ship, the crew had absolutely no idea where they were going. When it passed, the ship was revealed to in fact now be heading directly for the shore. The engines were very rapidly used to try and get the ship back on course, and then another squall set swept in. This time, by sheer random chance, when it cleared, the ship had somehow managed to make it through the channel and into the Indian Ocean. Now, however, more issues emerged. Torch batteries, which were being used to let the crew see what they were doing, were beginning to die. Hatches were beginning to leak, and various pumps, which had been running for hours on end, were beginning to overheat and fail. Various damaged electricity cables were also starting to overheat and short out. This, and the concurrent ever-rising water, made it something of a race against time to get to port. The next morning brought even more unwelcome news. Another flight of Japanese bombers was on the way. What ammunition was left was piled around the remaining operational anti-aircraft guns, 
but it looked like this would be the end for the ship. Then at the last moment, a stroke of fortune attended. One of the escorting destroyers, the USS Paul Jones, did look a little bit like an Omaha class as they shared the four-stack layout. Perhaps the mistake was forgivable. The Clemsons and the Omahas were of course also of roughly the same design era, and so the 40 Japanese planes expended all their bombs in seven attack runs directed at the destroyer instead of Marblehead. With the Paul Jones sailing madly at full throttle through all the water spouts, she somehow managed to make it through the ordeal undamaged. The next morning, the 6th of February, tugs from Chap met the battered Marblehead and hauled her into port, where she came across the somewhat less damaged Houston. Whilst the immediate danger was past, things were far from over. The Japanese were advancing quickly and this meant that any repairs needed to be done equally fast. There was a floating dry dock in the port, but it wasn't big enough for Marblehead. Instead, it was proposed to sink the dry dock under the bow and try and lift the ship partially out of the water in a kind of reverse launch, and then hope that the unbalanced load didn't capsize both the dock and the ship. Normally, this kind of lunatic idea would be completely out of the question as far too dangerous. But when the other choice was waiting for the Japanese to get there, and the Imperial Japanese Army was even at this very moment quite happily using freshly gunned down prisoners of war as road infill to facilitate a continuing advance, the dry dock was rather quickly placed into position. The most seriously wounded were now taken off the ship and to a hospital, where they had a better chance of survival, at least until the Japanese showed up. The story of the heroic doctor who would save many of them from the tender mercies of the Japanese army is a story in its own right. After three attempts, the ship was mostly out of the water, riding high with the bow completely out of the sea and the stern only partially submerged. The slightest ill movement might collapse the blocks and send her cascading back into the sea as if being launched a second time, but this time probably heading straight for the bottom. The damage assessment, though, could now be made in full. One bomb had exploded aft in the manual steering room. An armour-piercing bomb had struck amidships, but by sheer luck had managed to hit something solid on a whale boat, which had initiated the fuse a fraction of a second early. It thus exploded about a deck higher than it otherwise would have done. Without that providence, it would almost certainly have detonated amidst 50,000 gallons of fuel, and the ship would have been doomed in moments. A near miss had blown in the side around the forward magazines. Luckily, the flooding here, caused by the blast, had also eliminated any chance of an explosion. Entering this space found the most mysterious site of various kinds of ammunition, especially the three-inch one-piece fixed units, having been crushed, battered and twisted into a variety of modern art sculptures. This was a second lucky escape that also otherwise would have instantly sunk the ship. The facilities, though, were a bit limited beyond the fact that the dry dock was a bit too small. Nothing was available that could fix the steering gear, and Japanese reconnaissance planes were a daily visitation. The ship and its crew needed to be cleaned, and the remaining ammunition and loose debris removed, before any serious work could be done to patch up the damage. With this accomplished, hasty patches were installed over the worst of the holes, with wooden wedges driven in to splinter damage. The welds on the patch were imperfect, and they leaked, but they leaked at a rate that the pumps could at least keep up with. An awning was rigged over the fantail to keep out rain and spray. After a service to bury the dead, the ship was on its way out of the harbour. But this was Friday the 13th of February, so of course the line to the tug had to break and the ship drifted into the ostensibly friendly minefield that was positioned outside the harbour. Uh, frantically, the tug backed up to get another line rig, and the tug and the cruisers collided, and the last forward compartment that had been fully watertight lost that status. So now, with no working rudder, a hole in the bow, and overall leaking somewhat like a sieve, Marble set off for Ceylon, in company with the auxiliary ship Otis. In order to determine, you know, just in case the ship was about to break in two, which was a serious consideration given that a lot of her supporting internal structure was now so much twisted wreckage, a long piano wire was fastened to the foremast and to the aftmost part of the midship section. Although under tension, it sagged somewhat under its own weight in normal conditions. If it was ever seen to go straight, or worse yet, parted under tension, that meant that the ship was buckling and either the bow or the stern was about to fall off. Then, on the dawn of the second day, the sun revealed no sign of the Otis, 
so abandoning ship would have been out of the question anyway. And the ship pressed on alone, with the crew cobbling together a new freshwater distribution system and making an ice maker out of various broken bits of equipment. Whilst most of the canned food supply had survived, the labels, which had been immersed, had not, which made meals a rather interesting experiment in what exact foodstuff and flavouring you got this time. A day before they arrived in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, the ship met up with Otis again. The somewhat random nature of the cruiser's course without a rudder had apparently been somewhat difficult for Otis to keep track of during that first night. On February the 21st, the ship pulled into Trincomalee. There was a dry dock fit for much larger ships here, but enemy forces were reported to be closing in, and so it wasn't possible to use this facility. However, the brief stopover gave them enough time to put the finishing touches on a jury-rigged set of repairs for the steering gear. After a full start, and then some minor adjustments, the rudder was finally in a position to be at least somewhat capable of use, as long as you're a little bit delicate with it. With the ship able to determine its heading somewhat more easily, the next stop in their quest for repairs was to head for Simonstown, South Africa. Once envisaged as the heart of a much larger naval base than it now was, the Royal Dockyard was still more than capable of dealing with a mid-sized cruiser, and so off Marblehead went again, with a stop planned at Durban for fuel. The crew still had to keep their eyes peeled, though. Days earlier, HMAS Sydney had fallen victim to an ambush from the Hilfskreuzer Cormoran, and in her current state, Marblehead could easily be another victim if there was another raider out there. A brief stop in Durban, and some well-earned liberty later, the ship was on its way south when tragedy struck. Ski Wodzinski headed down into the forward holds to take a sounding of the water levels. Unfortunately, a wide accumulation of debris, including various chemicals, had made its way down to this level, and by now they'd begun to rot together. He was overcome by the resultant gases within moments. The man on watch with him went to try and get help. Bull Aschenbrenner, who we met earlier, answered this call and headed down, but he too was overcome. The crew, now realising the problem, scrambled to get emergency breathing apparatus, and whilst they were doing that, the ship's executive officer, Commander Van Bergen, went down on a rope, and he too was sent unconscious in seconds. Thanks to the fact he was attached to the rope, and thanks to his relatively brief exposure, he was pulled up and would recover after a few days. Unfortunately, by the time the breathing gear was found and the other two were hauled up, it was too late. Both men would pass away later in the course of the night. This meant that the first duty upon arrival to Simonstown was the sad one of a funeral procession, led by the captain for two men who'd been at the heart of the crew. With this solemn duty accomplished, the ship could finally be set mostly to rights. There was proper patching to be done, and a lot of temporary internal bracing needed to be installed. The mayor of Simonstown gave them a warm welcome, but when the captain went to look for him for, to return the favour, he was directed back to his own ship, as the mayor's day job was in the dockyard, and so he could be found each day with a blowtorch working on the American vessel. The ship was also inspected by a very large Great Dane, who turned out to be the dockyard's mascot, appropriately named Nuisance. One of the officers tried to get him to leave, but rapidly discovered that no one was willing to try and get a 200-pound dog that was larger than many of the crew to try and shift any way it didn't want to go after the first attempt to do so elicited a rather deep growl. Instead, able seaman Nuisance, who had been enlisted into the Royal Navy, completed his inspection at his leisure and, having found everything to his liking, departed in search of his favourite dinner, a bowl of beer. After 23 days of repairs and a little bit of shanghaiing that was necessary to get the crew back in order after some over-exuberance when it came to shore leave, Marblehead was back out at sea again. On approach to Brazil, they ran into another US ship, who challenged her, and when the reply was given that she was Marblehead, the reply came back, Are you sure? So often had the Japanese claimed her sunk that the other ship went to general quarters convinced that it was a ruse, until a closer inspection revealed the truth. Refuelled, and with some improvised depth charge racks fitted, since she was about to head into the middle of the Battle of the Atlantic, the ship steamed north, encountering and evading a submarine that they found on the surface, since the deck guns were of questionable use at this stage. <laughs> 
Luckily, despite the overall density of U-boats, the ship encountered nothing more threatening than the odd seagull subsequently, and on May the 4th, 1942, the battered ship arrived in New York Harbour. After a brief stop to discharge ammunition, they were soon under the Brooklyn Bridge, and finally, at long last, home. Marblehead would not put to sea again until the 15th of October, serving in the Atlantic on convoy escort and anti-raider duties, then into the Mediterranean in 1944, supporting the invasion of southern France. Returning to the USA in August 1944, she was put to work as a training ship for a year until she was decommissioned in November 1945 and subsequently scrapped in 1946. Captain Robinson, along with a number of other officers, received the Navy Cross for his actions and went on to command a number of shore stations as well as heading up the post-war military commission on war crimes in the Pacific Theatre before retiring as a vice admiral. The ship's XO at the time of the attack, Commander Goggins, escaped the Japanese, recovered from his burns, and later went on to command the battleship USS Alabama, eventually retiring as a rear admiral. His successor to the XO position, Commander Van Bergen, would go on to command the attack transport USS Clay, but I wasn't able to find out any further information about his career. The ship's story was first told, and in much greater detail than is possible to do in a roughly 40-minute video, in the book Where Away, A Modern Odyssey, authored by George Sessions Perry. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.